Kon 345. I hope y'all are doing well. Um, hope everything's going good. Couple things. Remember, I think we actually have our midterm next week. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that in class and what it looks like and stuff. Just, just know that's coming up and it's something you need to think about. It's going to be a take home midterm. So it's going to be essay based. And I do tend to grade a little harsh. That's why I tend to give a lot of extra credit opportunities in class. So let's talk about what can help you be most successful. I'm going to go over that in class this week. Okay, besides that, let's go ahead and jump right into it. So I was going to go into a deeper discussion of political economy, but we're actually going to do the type of political economy that talks about voting just because it's an election year and it's actually kind of interesting to think about what different voting systems are doing right now. So let's talk a bit about political economy. So why do governments do what they do? That's kind of an important question because there's different ways to organize government to produce different results. If we wanted to make it so that we had a good school system, we could have it in a completely government directed at the federal level school system. We could leave it completely up to local governments. We could fund it through taxes. We could fund it through um, intergovernmental transfers on income taxes. There's just so many things that we could do. And there's lots of different ways to organize government. Now, these might have similar results where we, where we do have, you know, one, one school, but the school's gonna be very different under each one of these situations, right? If it's managed locally, then it tends to have more local issues. If it's managed nationally, then there tends to be a curriculum that's set across every single school. If it's managed by taxes, then our property taxes, then schools in rich neighborhoods tend to be richer schools as opposed to schools in poor neighborhoods. So there's lots of different ways to organize government. You produce similar or different results depending, and, and there's just a lot of freedom in that. So political economy is starting to go into the discussion of what are these core base differences? How do we even determine how something's going to happen. So we have a few different keywords that we need to know before we go deeper into it. The first is gonna be the idea, the ideal case, right? Where government measures preferences and acts accordingly. In a perfect world, the government would come to you, ask you what you want, and then they would do that. We all know that's not necessarily how it works. So that's sort, of, that's sort of the ideal case. That's the goal case. It's one that we try to work towards by trying to develop good democratic systems. So we have two different types of democracy that we're going to talk about. First is direct democracy. This is where different things come up on the ballots and you vote for them. So like you'd vote for, ah, new park. Uh, oh, this tax increase. Yes or no. Or, oh, um, they want to rezone the district in downtown Edwardsville for such and such type of business. Yes or no? Those, those are direct democracy and it's where voters directly cast ballots in favor or, or in opposition to certain sorts of public projects. Then we have representative democracy. So representative democracy is when voters elect representatives. This is the one that you're probably pretty familiar with, right? You vote for your governor, you vote for your senators, you vote for your president, you vote for your vice president, you vote for people that kind of represent your interest and trust them to sort of make decisions um, on public projects. And that keeps you from having to vote on every single issue every single time at the polls, right? So good systems typically have a little bit of both. Let's talk, let's talk a little bit into it. But first, I'm gonna go into Lindell pricing. I'm pretty sure that whoever took 445 just has like a uh, face going on right now thinking about Lindell pricing. But let, let me set this up. Let's say that we needed fire engines in Edwardsville. Or let's just assume it's the entire nation. We needed fire engines. Well, I can't really get an individual to buy a fire engine. Like my benefit from a fire engine being in my neighborhood is like, I don't know, a hundred bucks a year. That's not enough to buy one. So sometimes what we need to do is we need to figure out what everybody's valuation is. Maybe mine's $100, maybe yours is $150, maybe our neighbor's $50, and figure that out and figure out some sort of tax scheme that makes it so that we tax people relative to their valuation in order to get enough money to be able to purchase something that might benefit everyone because these tend to be non-excludable goods. So Lindell pricing is just an approach to trying to figure out how to finance public goods in which individuals honestly reveal their willingness to pay for government public good, which that's difficult, right? If I came up to you and I said, how much are you willing to pay for the park? 
you're, you'd probably just say um, zero. I, I don't really want to pay for the park because they can't exclude you from it. So why pay for it? And that's, that's kind of a thought that a lot of people get. So Lindell pricing is a way of trying to circumvent that by getting people to reveal their true marginal willingness to pay. So it's developing some sort of system that gets people to actually sit there and value these public goods and figure out about how much they would actually pay for this park. Or, or whatever else good, fire trucks, um, fireworks, um, water sewage systems, any sort of public work. And then what we do is we aggregate these values. So that means we add them together for every single person and try to put it together. And we do this because we're trying to figure out what the total social benefit is so that we can mark that relative to the social cost. So charging each individual according to his or her own willingness to pay makes sense, right? If someone really actually values the parks and I can elicit that, why wouldn't I charge them more than someone who doesn't value the parks at all and would never go to the parks? So Lindell pricing is one of the ways that we can try to get unanimous consent on a public good. Unanimous consent just means that we're using everyone's valuation for what it is, so no one is really against the park at all. Oops, wasn't going forward. So let's talk about how this works in steps. So if I want people to reveal to me how much they actually value something, well, how are we gonna go about that? So there's gonna be six steps. Let's talk about the first three. The first one is I just shout out tax prices. Like, ah, I'm gonna tax you $40. Okay, and then everybody says how much of the public good they want at those tax prices. So, okay, $40, hmm. I, I feel like I'd like a fire truck for $40. One fire truck though. We don't need two fire trucks in town, but one fire truck, that sounds pretty good. And then they call out and they say, oh, well, what about $100? How many fire trucks would you want for $100? And I'm like, oh, if I'm paying $100 in taxes, that's a lot in taxes. I want at least two fire trucks in town if I'm paying that much in taxes. And when we ask everybody these different valuations where they we give them different tax bills and they tell us what they expect for those tax bills, then we can construct their marginal willingness to pay. It lets us kind of put together what they value the next amount of something. So recall that if we want efficient provisions, if we want to have um, the public goods in an efficient way so we have enough of them and they've gone to all the right people, it requires that we have to have our marginal willingness to pay equal to our marginal cost. This is all the way back in Econ 112, right? We have our marginal cost, which is just essentially our supply curve. We have our willingness to pay, which is kind of close to our marginal benefit, which is just our downward sloping demand curve. We have some point in the middle. We want to be at that official, efficient price and quantity. So the way of trying to get there is by eliciting people's willingness to pay. And one way to do it is just by yelling out numbers and figuring out what quantity they want for it. So we have to figure out how much as a society they want. Remember, this is the difference between individual demand and market demand. This market demand is adding together all these little individual demands. It's the same thing with Lindell pricing. If we're trying to figure out how much of something that we want on at each price point or how much we're willing to pay at each quantity point, then we need to be able to add up everybody's individual willingness to pay. So for example, for one fire truck, maybe after we do all the math, we find out that I'm really willing to pay about 50 bucks for that first fire truck. And maybe my neighbor's willing to pay 25. Maybe my other neighbor's willing to pay 100. Well, together that's 175. That's more than what any of us would have paid separately, but together we're getting closer to being able to afford that fire truck, right? So we're gonna add up people's willingness to pay at each quantity of a good. And we're gonna find the quantity such that the willingness to pay, where, where our, our benefit kind of is, what we're willing to pay for a particular amount of a good equals the marginal cost. So how much that good actually costs. Okay, mm -hmm. fire trucks are a little tough. Let's think about street lamps. Let's say that for a street lamp, I'm willing to pay $10. My neighbor's willing to pay 20, the person across the street's 30 and the person diagonally is 40. But maybe a street light costs 50 bucks. Well, none of us independently are willing to pay $50, but the four of us together are actually willing to pay more than that. So maybe we make it proportional. Maybe because I was willing to pay $10, maybe I end up paying five. The person who's willing to pay $20 puts in 10. The person who is willing to put in 30 puts in 15. The person who is willing to put in 40 puts in 20. All of a sudden we have $50 now. We're all paying a little bit less than what we would have been willing to pay for this one um, light because we made it next to its marginal cost. Its marginal cost is how much does the light cost? If it costs 50, we're gonna make that equal to our willingness to pay where we just proportionately 
charge people based upon their valuation. So if I value at the least, I throw in the least amount of money. If the person diagonally values it the most, they throw in the most amount of money until we have a pot of money that's equal to what the cost is going to be. So that's kind of what the Lindell pricing equation is doing. And we finance the public good by charging these individuals their willingness to pay for that quantity. All right, let's think about this. Let's say, um, hmm. Maybe there's a fireworks show, right? And an individual firework costs about a dollar. Now, a cool fireworks show in town, I can't stop anybody from going and looking at the Edwardsville fireworks when, whenever we have them, you know, right? So let's say it's a dollar per firework. Well, if it's a dollar per firework, let's go look. If we have Ava up here at the top, her margin or willingness to pay, she actually wouldn't buy any fireworks if they were a dollar. That, that's a little pricey. Okay, what about Jack? Well, if it was a dollar, Jack would have about 60, probably buy about 60. But what if we put them together? What if we considered the fact that at 75 of these, Ava would have been willing to pay 25 cents for 75. And maybe at 75, Jack was willing to pay 75 cents. Well, together that equals a dollar. If they came together and one threw in 25 cents and the other one threw in 75 cents, that's the dollar of the marginal cost. So what we do, is we're vertically summing these things together. So we're just kind of stacking them on top of each other, right? So we have what Jack's marginal willingness to pay us. So for example, if at zero, he at about $3, that's where he intersects with the y-axis. Um, Ava intersects with the y-axis at $1. So $3 plus $1, we see that our new intercept right here is gonna be $4. Okay, let's do 25. At 25, Jack's willing to pay $2.25. At 25, Ava's willing to pay 75 cents. Together, that three to, uh, $3? Yeah, so at 25, we go up to 225 and then up to $3. We have that right there. It's just adding the two triangles together. And then what we do is we find our marginal cost line. I typically will give you a marginal cost. And I'll say, hey, the marginal cost is a dollar. We go to that price point, we draw a line across, and we see where it intersects with society's willingness to pay. So under Lindell pricing, the really, really cool part of Lindell pricing is that we've looked at everybody's marginal benefit and we've looked at everybody's marginal cost and we've figured out where it intersects so that every person's price for that good, everybody's price for the fireworks show or for the fire engines or for the lamppost or anything else, is equal to what their marginal willingness to pay is going to be for it. This is actually a beautiful and interesting tax system. If we could do everything like this, if we could do every public good like this, we would only have efficient amounts of the public good. We call this sort of idea a benefit taxation, right? So a benefit taxation means that you're taxed for a public good. So you're taxed for that park or for that street lamp or for that fireworks show or for that fire truck, kind of equal to what your valuation of the benefit from it is. Now there's problems with that, right? Not everybody ends up paying the same amount, which it turns out people get very mad when you start charging them different amounts of taxes. But it also is a little difficult getting people to actually reveal their preferences because they might have a good idea of it, right? If I say, ah, $25 in taxes, I might not really know how many fire trucks I want for $25 in taxes. I'm very misinformed about how much benefit I have from having a fire truck in the neighborhood. I really don't know if that helps me or not. Like I pay renter's insurance. So I think I'm okay if there's, if there's a fire. I, uh, so that means that there's some sort of knowledge problem that's happening. People may not know every single situation, which makes it difficult to reveal what our actual preferences are. Also, I might want to lie, right? If I know that the person across the street's already going to take a majority of the price of that street lamp, then I might be like, ha ha ha, I don't really value street lamps and just say that when really I do and I end up paying less, right? So when I'm adding these all together, if people have, have a tendency to lie, then I might end up overcharging someone when someone else might have benefited more from this good. So Lindell pricing is a really interesting and cool strategy. The problem is how do we implement it efficiently? So that kind of brings us into the idea of direct democracy. With Lindell pricing, if we got it to work, we would have to have unanimous consent. Literally everyone would have to be okay with there being a street lamp. Some people may not value it all and not pay for it. Um, some people might value it a lot and they pay for it, but there has to be unanimous consent of the street light happening or the fireworks show or something else like that. But we don't necessarily have that. We have more of a direct democracy. So demec demec I, can't, I can't talk tonight. Direct democracy is strong in the United States for some types of decisions, right? So we tend to do this for referendums. 
Referendums are measures placed on ballots that allow citizens to vote on state laws. So, hey, are we going to raise or lower the drinking age? Voting for that, it's a referendum. Um, are we going to put in this new tax? Voting for it, it's a referendum, right? So these measures placed on ballots allow citizens to vote on state laws or constitutional amendments. Another thing that we tend to have of our direct democracy approach, because we do have a government founded on, on trying to understand and represent the, the values of the people that live in the constituency, our voter initiatives, which is the placement of just legislation on a ballot by citizens. Us as citizens, we can go to the town hall and say, we demand for this to happen and throw a hissy fit and get signatures and, and start yelling and stuff. And we can eventually get something placed on the ballot with hard work. And that, that's an interesting part of our, our part of democracy is that voters have the right to be able to do that or citizens have the right to be able to do that. So it's election season. <laughs> uh, that's why I thought this might actually be kind of an interesting lecture right now because let's see, we um, have early voting's already started in Illinois. Any of you can go up to the Edwardsville courthouse if you happen to be a Madison County resident and just vote. You can do that early, early voting's open. Um, election day is what, November 3rd, I think? It's coming up so soon, that's like a month away. So let's think about what these voting patterns might actually look like. So Lindell pricing, requires unanimous consent, but most governments typically only use majority voting. So majority voting is you have two or more candidates and whoever has the most votes wins, right? This is the typical mechanism used to aggregate individual votes or to have an idea of what the individuals look our votes look like for a social decision because individual policy options are put up to a vote and the option that receives the majority of the votes is chosen. Do you want this tax? Yes or no? whatever has the majority wins, right? So sometimes it works. Let me give you an example of that. In this, in this example, let's assume that we have three different types of voters. And let's say that maybe we're looking at the level of schooling in, in an area, right? Because that's something that typically happens. Um, we, we vote on if we want really good schools or if we wanna pay less taxes and have okay schools or we wanna play very few taxes and just have terrible schools, right? So we can have low, medium, or high levels of schooling, or they're the amount that we're actually gonna put into the schooling. Now there's different types of voters, right? There's people who have kids at home, there's people who are elderly who are like, why am I paying this? All of my kids are graduated, I don't wanna pay for the schools anymore. There's young couples who might plan to have kids in the future, maybe, maybe they're not decided on it yet, maybe they don't really want them. So we don't necessarily know their, their preferences. So let's see what happens in this. If we have the high, medium, and low versions of schooling. Well, so for our type of voters, ah, no, go away. My, um, I forgot to turn off Steam and Steam just like, ah, oh, people are in games. Okay, so have you all played that game Among Us? I've been really into that lately. Okay, I'll stop. So let's say that we want to figure out if people prefer high levels of schooling or medium levels of schooling. Well, then we'd go to each type of voter. So let's say that maybe parents are a third of the voter. Okay, they prefer high to medium. Okay, okay, fine. Okay, then we go to the elderly. Elderly, they, they'd they rather have, they, they're done paying for schools. They, they don't have kids in school anymore. So they kind of want the low version of schooling. So medium beats high in this one. Okay, all right, okay. And then the young couple, well, medium beats high again. Okay, so high is that or because the, the medium ends up beating it. Well, then let's look at medium versus low. Okay, medium beats low. Low beats medium. Medium beats low. Medium beats low two out of the three times. Okay, medium beats low. So medium beats high, medium beats low, medium wins. Yeah, super easy, that totally works. Um, this would win if majority voting is consistent. The problem is some people are not always consistent with their preferences. Let me let me show you another example of, of when this might fall apart. Also, you should probably be looking at this and thinking like, huh, that's kind of weird. This seems to be ranked preference voting because that one state, let me look up which one it is. Ranked preference, I think it's Maine. Uh, I don't, uh, yeah, Maine. Okay, so Maine's doing ranked preference voting this time. Let me go ahead and tell you something. It doesn't work because 
you you have you have situations like this where it's nice and easy and it makes sense yeah and then you have situations like this all right let's look at high versus medium okay high winds high winds medium winds okay high beats medium let's look at medium versus low medium beats low low beats medium medium beats low oh okay high beats medium and then medium beats low well then what about low and high okay high beats low low beats high low beats high whoa whoa low beats high but high meets medium but medium actually beats low and low beats high and high beats medium and medium actually beats low notice that the transitive property falls apart there that's not a clear ranked order that means that something's gone wrong here and there, there's some sort of cyclicalness where the preferences don't always make sense it's the idea of preferring option a to b and preferring option b to c and then preferring option c to a this doesn't necessarily make sense but that happens when we have ranked voting systems because unless you have two options that you're choosing in between if you have more than two options it makes it so that you're actually very likely to end out with options that weren't necessarily strongly preferred by anybody so for example um india and a few other countries tend to have ranked voting systems in these particular countries what we see happening is they'll vote for let's say for their president or or version of president okay so they'll have whoever their favorite person is and then like they'll put the third party candidate next because they really don't like that one person and then the next person will have who they vote for and then the third party candidate and then the person that they really don't like underneath and then and then the thing is the person who ends up winning happens to be the person that people just didn't hate. So a lot of the time they end up getting people winning the presidency that weren't necessarily anybody's strong pick. It was just the person that got put last least often. And that's just interesting to me because that that's saying something a lot about political systems across countries. And that's one of the neat things about public economics is we get to explore that. So ranked voting can fall apart very quickly because sometimes transitive preferences don't always hold in practice. That actually brings us next to errors and possibility theorem. So I'm not going to make you prove the math on this, but if you ever want to know the math, please let me know, especially if you plan to do a PhD because then you're going to need to know the math. But in situations like that, where we try to do the runoffs one versus the other, sometimes they fall apart, where high might be low and low might be medium and medium might be high. And then we have like the circle happening, right? Well, we could let everyone vote on their first choice, or we could do a weighted voting by assignment, or maybe they kind of like this one and maybe they kind of like that one. But there's no good way to actually add up preferences. It turns out when we have more than two options for something, there's no real good way in voting to be able to pick an option. Errors and possibilities theorem says that there's no social decision that you can make by voting that converts individual preferences into a consistent, predictable, aggregate decision without either one, restricting you to only two choices, which is how we kind of end up with the two party system, by the way, uh, restricting you to either two choices or imposing a dictatorship. The only other way to get a consistent answer every single time from people doing some sort of ranked voting is if you allow one person to just make the decision and be the dictator, or you have only two options. So one way to avoid the impossibility theorem is to restrict the preferences, right? To say, ah, oh, okay, well, technically we'll give you more candidates than that, but you can really only vote between the two candidates. And then we have the median voter theorem. So when you only have two candidates, like we see in a majority of our presidential races, right? Because they, they only allow two to debate. They only, even though we technically have the Libertarian Party on every single ticket in the United States this year, there's still really only two options that are going to get majority of the votes or the Electoral College will end up voting for because we do have the Electoral College system. So we have this median voter theorem. Median voter theorem is just that the majority of voting will yield the outcome preferred by the median voter if preferences are single peaked. Okay. If group A likes candidate A and group B likes candidate B, then most of the people are already going to vote for who those people are. The thing is, median voter means it doesn't matter about the people who really, really like A and it doesn't really matter the people who really, really like B. What matters is probably a term that you've heard a lot, which is swing voters. It's those median voters. They're the ones right in the middle that could either go for A or for B. 
the majority of the voting system gets built around trying to attract those median voters because it turns out the decisions that are being made don't get made by the people in group A, they're not made by the people in group B, they're made by the people who could go either to group A or group B and they end up having the power of choice, which is why a lot of um, campaigns tend to be aggregated on trying to focus on this median voter idea. Median voters are just people whose tastes are kind of in the middle of the pack. So the government needs to find only that one voter, that one person right in the middle whose preferences for the public good are right in the middle of the distribution. So let's say it's parks. Let's say that some people really like parks and some people really dislike parks. So we have the group that really, really, really likes parks and we have the group that really, really, really doesn't like parks. Well, if, if politicians need to be able to sway a victory, they, they don't need to talk to either one of these two groups, right? So you have the people who like parks and the people who don't like parks. The entire election in that case on if you get parks or not really comes down to who's this median voter? Who's the person in the middle who are like, eh, I could take it on, leave it on parks. And then how do you speak to them? So that's kind of neat. That's the idea of median voter theory. And it explains why so much of campaign time is spent on swing voters. So notice that there are also inefficiencies with this because what you kind of learn from being a public economist is that every single voting system is broken and we've yet to figure out how to do it correctly. But we can try to minimize the potential inefficiencies. The ways that we do this is by minimizing the number of options or by creating different sorts of systems where, where there's a set way to come up with a decision. Now, some potential inefficiencies that we see with this median voter theorem is that a majority of voting and the median voter theorem are are potentially inefficient, right? Because notice in that, I had said that group A likes parks, group B does not like parks, and it's kind of up to the person in the middle who's like, eh, I could take it or leave it on parks. But that doesn't think about the severity to which the groups dislike or like parks. Let's say that group A, they love parks. They like to go for runs in the park. They'd maybe pay like 10 bucks for the park. But the people who hate parks really dislike parks. They get $20 of cost to them with the park because they are just so unhappy at the park being there. It costs them like $20 in pain. These people get $10 benefits. These people get $20 in pain. If we tried to equal it out, that'd actually be a negative number, right? If we tried to actually weight everybody's like or dislike, we would have a different answer than relying on just the one median voter. So suppose that 51% of the votes were for this group A that really wanted the park and they value it at $10. And 49% is at group B. They oppose it and they get hurt by $20. Well, under majority voting, this group right here, group A who gets $10 of benefit, they'd end up winning, right? But the surplus, the total surplus or total happiness in society would drop when they win because there were people that were hurt more than the benefit that that group got. So majority voting doesn't recognize the intensity of preferences. Wouldn't that be neat if we could actually do elections where we could go to every single person and find out just how intently they care about certain topics and then weight the decision based upon the intensity of feelings? We can't, but that's one of the potential inefficiencies with voting is that if you give everyone the same vote, it doesn't weight it by how much this might matter, right? You're putting in a new highway. Um, there might be one person who doesn't want the highway and there might be 10 people who do want the highway. The 10 people who want the highway want a five minute quicker drive to work. The one person who doesn't want the highway, it's gonna go through like their grandparents' house who had passed away and it's gonna bulldoze the family plantation and they're gonna be out of a place to live for these 10 people to get a five minute quicker drive to work. These things don't always balance out because we don't understand the intensity of what people are voting on. So there's a couple of assumptions that come with this median voter theorem. The idea that like it's not group A and it's not group B, it's really that swing voter in the middle. And that's the idea of single dimension voting. So we have to assume that all the votes are based off of this one issue. Notice that I had said the issue of parks. It's I like parks or I don't like parks. And then there's this person who's like, ah, parks. But representatives are elected on bundles of issues. It turns out that there's probably not a representative out there that you agree on every single issue, statistically, right? But you, you can't have the representative for just the person to represent the parks and just the person to represent the pools and just the person to represent the, the fireworks show. 
Instead, you represent people based upon a bundle of goods or how they feel about all of these items and hope that most of the time they vote the direction that you want them to. So different people may be at different points of the voting spectrum on different issues. There might be someone who really, really hates fireworks and really loves parks. And there might be someone who's like, eh, fireworks and eh, parks, but I hate pools. And there might be someone who loves pools, but dislikes parks. There's wide varieties of different policy prescriptions of how people feel about different things. So, Assumptions of the medium voter also assume that we only have two candidates, right? Because we saw what happens early. If you have more than two candidates and you allow people to, to rank or try to figure out their preferences, you either end up with a third party that you don't necessarily like, or you end up with the this errors and possibility theorem where like people prefer A to B and then they prefer B to C, but they prefer C to A, which is preferred to B, which is preferred to C, which is preferred to A. And you have this triangle, this issue that's going to happen, which is why we have to limit it down to two different options for it to not fall apart, that or have a dictator, right? So most of our assumptions on median voter theorem assume that there's only two goods. You either like the park or you don't like the park. It's not you like the park, you don't like the park, or you want the park in another town. No, there's only there's only two options. You like the park, you don't like the park. So we, we tend to assume two candidates. So no equilibrium in the, with, in the model with three or more candidates can be 100% foolproof, right? It could be the fact that if you have three candidates like park, no park, park in another town, maybe everybody loves park and it wins across the board. Like it could have that efficient outcome. But as soon as you go to more than two options, you always allow for this ability of this bias to happen, of this ability for it to fall apart because there might be incentives that don't necessarily match up. So we also have to assume that there's no ideological influence, right? We're talking about likes parks versus doesn't like parks and the person in the middle who kind of gets to have the choice on, on whether they like parks or not, even if they're relatively indifferent. The median voter theory assumes that politicians care only about maximizing votes. They only want the most amount of votes. But we don't, if that's true, if that's true, if they only care about maximizing the medium amount of votes, then what you would have is you'd have politicians that come and they tend to speak to the middle of the pack, right? They talk only to the swing voters and only make small moves left or right. But we don't always find that. Sometimes we tend to have more extremes on likes the park or doesn't like the park as opposed to, oh, well, maybe we have a little bit of park or a little bit not park. Right. But but with the medium voter theorem, we kind of assume that politicians, since they're speaking to these swing voters, will actually have more moderate plans to be able to to speak to them and to be able to try to influence votes because the politician's goal is to maximize votes so that they can make a decision on park or no park. So we also have a couple more assumptions with medium voter theorem. I know so many assumptions, right? Oh, did you know that voting was going to be so complicated? Because guess what? It's very, very complicated. I, I know I'm a public economist. I studied this for a living. So we also have to think that there's no selective voting, which means um, all people are affected by the public good. Everybody either gets affected by the park or not park. Uh, then we also have to think that there's no money. So there, there's no money to pay people off in this. And the there, there's no tool of influence in the election. And if we take an extreme position on a topic, maybe the swing voters don't necessarily like that. They might want people closer to the median. And we also have to assume that people have full information. So we have to assume that everyone in that knows if they like the park or if they don't like the park and what the park even means. They have to, we, we assume that they know that. But the problem is there might be someone who's never heard of a park before or never been to a park or have no idea if they would like the park. There, it's a very strong assumption to assume that every voter has full information about the things they're voting about. So notice that the idea of having no money in a system doesn't necessarily match what we see. What we see with a lot of different political voting systems is we do have an idea of lobbying. So lobbying, let's say that we know we have the people who like parks. So we have the two different streams, people who like parks and people who don't like parks. And then we have the person who could go either way on parks. This introduces the possibility of lobbying. This means that there might be someone on either side. So maybe the people that really, really, really like parks, maybe they're willing to pay some money to go talk to a lobbyist to have them talk to the swing voters to try to get them into parks. And then there's the people who really, really don't like parks and it's going to like hurt them. So they're going to want to spend some money to try to hire someone to try to influence that swing voter to not won't parks. Lobbying can help convey the intensity of preferences because how much these sides are willing to pay for the lobbying party reflects 
how much damage or benefit they get from a particular type of policy. And it can help inform politicians on what the severity or the intensity of certain sides of a political argument are. But it's not always the most efficient, right? And lobbying also suffers from the idea of the free rider problem. It could be that maybe maybe I'm sort of indifferent to parks, but maybe I kind of like parks a little bit, but I'm going to say that I'm the swing voter so that the parks people will pay to wine and dine me at a park and, and take me out to go look at the parks and stuff like that. There, there's a free rider problem where I'm like, you know what, maybe maybe I'm just, I'm just going to ride with it. Maybe I'm just going to ride with it. I'm going to go with whatever decision. I, I'll, t I'll, take, I'll take the lobbying either way. I'm going to reap the benefits of this, even though I didn't necessarily pay for it directly. So We've had an increasing polarization in American politics, right? Little did you know that this sometimes is a political science class too, because public is also public policy and political science and a little bit of other things. We're also a little bit of theology and philosophy, but I'm not the best philosopher. This, these, these charts only go to 2005, or oh, um, or, or less, because apparently it cut off parts of my chart. That happens. But we've seen over time that that sometimes we have the Republican groups, we have the Democrat groups, sometimes they'll come closer together on issues and sometimes they'll go further apart on issues, but a lot of the time they tend to get a little bit further apart, right? We tend to have this polarization of you're in team park or you're in team no park. And that's been increasing in the past 20 years or so where we've had this extreme polarization happening. So that means that there's lobbying, that means that the median voter theorem becomes very, um, political based. And it means that there, there's a lot of effort on the severity of preferences that tried to get instilled upon the swing voters. That's kind of cool. That's kind of interesting. It's, it's neat to think how, how just entire voting systems work, right? So then we also have this idea of public choice theory. So the failure of this median voter model indicates the governments may not always enact things in citizens' preferences, right? Sometimes politicians might want to get more votes. So let's say that the politician had really, really strong feelings on public swimming pools. Well, they want to get elected and they get elected off a bundle of goods. So maybe what they'll instead do is go over to the argument of parks versus no parks and try to sway one person over to the park side because then, then they can have their more extreme view of, of the public pools, right? Public choice theory is just kind of a school of thought. It's a way of thinking about all of these arrangements that emphasize that government may not always maximize the well-being of citizens. If we um, hire them or elect them on bundles of goods, then that bundle of goods may not maximize in every single case what the majority of people want. Right, which means that there's a, an instance of government failure. There might be an inability or an unwillingness of government to act primarily in the interest of its citizens because instead it's, it's acting on trying to get a swing voter or, or have more polarized ideas on particular topics. And that introduces the case of government failure. So what is one of the government failures? Well, one of the government failures is the fact that every bureaucrat wants their biggest budget possible, right? That totally makes sense. The FDA thinks the FDA is the best thing ever and they want the most money. The census thinks the census is the best thing ever and wants the most money. Um, the forestry services thinks the forestry services is pretty cool and they want an increased budget too, right? Everybody wants a bigger budget. That makes sense. I'm sure that you probably experienced that at your work where you're like, hey, it'd be really great if we could have like New York or uniforms or things like that. Cat, what do you want? Come here. No, and now she ran away. I was going to show you the cat because the cat just, I don't know, really wants to have attention tonight. So we have this size maximizing bureaucracy problem. It's the theory of government failure begins when we start looking at these bureaucratic groups. So not all bureaucrats are elected, right? Many of these are civil service servants, such as the US Department of Education, Public Works. They're in charge of carrying out the services of government and they're not necessarily elected there. Some are appointed, some apply for the job and get interviewed and, and they are not necessarily appointed or voted for by the people but they want their biggest budget, right? So the EPA is going to go to the Republicans and then they're going to go to the Democrats and they're going to say, hey, we need a bigger budget. And then the FDA is gonna do that. And then all the other groups are going to do that because every single bureaucrat wants to be this budget maximizing bureaucrat, which 
runs into a little bit of a problem, right? Because if everybody wants to maximize their particular agenda because they think that their agenda is the most important, then you're not necessarily going to get the provision or the set of provisions that the individuals or the voters want, right? Because it's it's maximizing its own influence. This this actually brings in the idea of corruption. So if we have a bunch of bureaucrats who are trying to maximize their own budget, that is not necessarily in in what the amount that the public want is. Then this introduces a specific type of market failure. Where look, why do you keep coming over here? She just she really wants me to throw the ball. We're gonna have to end this soon so I can go play with the cat and make the cat happy because all she wants is attention right now. Yes, yes, you're cute. My life is run by an 11 pound fur ball and I would restart this recording, but I'm already like 30 minutes into it and we're not gonna do that. All right, so if we have people who are trying to maximize their budget, then we introduce a possibility for corruption, right? Because we have this government failure. It's a type of market failure when we're, what society wants of goods and services are not necessarily what profit maximizing bureaucrats want out of goods and services because they all want more money for their department. But them all having the most money for the department may not equal what, what the people want for those individual departments. So corruption is an important form of the government failure problem. Corruption is just kind of the abuse of power by government officials in order to maximize their own personal wealth or that of their associates. So this may be constrained through electoral accountability. If, if we do elect people, then they have some sort of representation by people. They have to be able to get voted for again, which means that they want to keep their corruption down because they want to be able to get voted for again. But corruption also appears to be more rampant in political systems that feature more red tape. When we have lots of bureaucratic barriers um, and we have lots of hoops that people have to jump through and we have more agencies and we have more people working at all the agencies and we have more forms that have to get filled out. Hi, now you want to touch Stormy wants to say hi. There you go. She's very cute. Good cat. All right. So the, the more of these bureaucratic barriers we have, that makes it kind of costly to do business within a country. Right, which is why we actually see that there, the the corruption index is almost exactly disproportionate to the human development index. So the higher like a human development and economic freedom goes, like the lower corruption goes, and and it flip flops sometimes. So that's just kind of interesting how that, that's in there. So there's implications for government failure when we introduce the possibility of corruption into a system. Do these failures have important implications? Of course they do, because this means that we we might have disproportionate resources going to places that may not be in the voters best interest or in society's best interest. Can citizens use policies such as property tax and limitations to limit the harm imposed by government structure? Sure, they can. I mean, if, if you believe that there is a government structure that might be imposing harm, then luckily with a direct democracy, there, there's way to get to get referendums on the ballots or there's ways to get other sorts of things present or to vote for people that might have particular types of agendas that, that would align closer to what you want. But evidence has suggested that government failures can have long lasting negative impacts, right? What's, what's the most extreme example that we can think of? Um, Korea, right? Back in the 1950s or 1960s, the, the country split into two. Right when they split, you had almost equal resources on both sides. North Korea was a little bit colder and they were about an inch shorter. shorter. Now, years later, what you've seen is that um, socioeconomic status has completely changed. Uh, North Korea has kept relatively low, while South Korea has increased the GDP per capita. Um, heights, birth defects, survivability after the age of five tends to stay fairly lower in North Korea, while it has continued to grow in South Korea, because there's some sort of government failure on one side of the border that may not be present on the other side of the border. Right? So there's a lot of implications here for when we introduce corruption into a system. So with that, that was just kind of our thought experiment of voting because you know it's, it's election season. It's kind of always interesting to think about. You have a midterm coming up. I will talk to you more about that in class. If you are not going to be in class this week, please email me so I can A, give you an alternative assignment and B, so that we can set up appointments so that I can tell you about your test. All right, everybody, have a great one. I'll talk to you later, bye.